Okay, so how do we see? We have, uh, let's just talk very broadly about the visual fields. Most of the visual field, and we see not 180, but darn close to 180, uh, most of the visual field is seen by both eyes. But there's a little bit, if, I clo if I'm looking out here and now I close one of my eyes, I see that a little bit out here is now not visible to me. It's, it's only visible to this eye. So with this eye, I can see to right there, I close. OK, so I can see to right there with both eyes. Now I close. And I can't see my, with my right eye until here. So this is the, this bit out here is the temporal crescent. It is a monocular field. It's only seen by the ipsilateral eye. Then the nose gets in the way. So this is the monocular field of the, of the ipsilateral eye. This is the other monocular field of the other eye. And here is the binocular field. Now, the, one of the important points is, remember that, that these fields are, are uh, dependent on one looking at or fixating on this middle point. Okay? So the first important point that I want to make is that swamped out by the binocular, binocularity of the middle of the, the bulk of the visual field is the fact that we have two blind spots, one for each eye. There is a whole area right here that you cannot, that I cannot see, you cannot see. There's no information coming in from there. What's the, what is, what's the physical basis of the blind spot? The physical basis of the blind spot is where all the axons of the retinal ganglion cells collect to form the optic nerve. So if, where you have the optic nerve, you actually have no room for anything else, including photoreceptors. So there are no photoreceptors there. There's just all these collecting axons. So you just have, there's no information coming in from these two blind spots. These are pretty big. You can estimate where the, you can see the, the extent of the blind spot by closing, um, by fixating on a point and then tracing a, uh, with a pencil, tracing a line out. And you'll see that the tip of that pencil will just disappear at some point. That's where your blind spot is. And it's not, it's not uh, inconsequential. It's a pretty large spot. There are two things that allow you to cover up that blind spot, to not see, not to, to not perceive that blind spot. One is that you fill in, even if, even if I only have one eye open, my eye fills that spot in. It, it takes everything in the surround and sort of, uh, assumes that the, the blind spot has the same stuff as what's in, in the surround. There's a reason why this blind spot is off in the periphery, because our acuity, our ability, our resolution of, of vision is much less off in the periphery. So at these, these it, this is a central vision, and this is a, uh, progressively more eccentric or f peripheral vision. And out here, uh, we, don't, we don't have fine vision. You can't read something out by the blind spot. You couldn't read. If you were fixating here, uh, you couldn't read anything um, at that eccentricity. So there's fill, there's fill in from the uh, same eye. And then, of course, there's fill in from the opposite eye. So how would you know if you had a hole in your visual field? You can get a hole in your visual field, say, if there's damage to some axons in the optic tract or some axons in the optic radiation. Well, how would you know? Well, first of all, you probably wouldn't know as long as both eyes are open. Um, so the first thing you want to do if you, if you think you might uh, have a problem with visual fields is close each eye and see if you see um, a hole. Now, the other thing is that the hole has to be really, really big before you will perceive it. So we already saw that even with one eye open, all you, me, everybody will fill in this blind spot very easily. So in order to get a scotoma, the, and, and this is a scotoma that goes here, uh, you'll only see it in the monocular, um, in the monocular uh, field 
uh, until it gets really big, in which case you'll stop being able to fill it in with the other eye or with, or the, or with the surround part of, of the eye. Even so, you can have a pretty large scotoma and not, um, and not realize it. Uh, I, ha I have a friend who was telling me uh, he, he actually had a, a, a retinal detachment, and before he had the retinal detachment, the retina was probably um, starting to detach and starting to not work very well because he told me that for months he, he had this perception that his nose was getting bigger. So he was losing sight because he thought his nose was getting bigger, but in fact the retina was coming off. He had a, he had a scotoma. Um, he is thankfully uh, doing very well. So uh, these scotomas are, are pretty difficult to detect, uh, and that's intentionally so. That's a real tribute to the efficacy of the visual system. Uh, you can learn how to detect them, and you will learn how to detect them. Now, in contrast to these scot the scotomas that I was talking about that are out in the periphery, if you lo lose uh, vision in the center of the uh, visual field, you'll notice it a lot faster and at a, at a lot smaller bit of um, uh, of damage. So here, if you are fixating on this red dot, what this, uh, what this chart shows you is how large a letter has to be in order for you to detect it depending on its, on its location across the visual field. And what you can see is that your acuity, your ability to resolve small detail is much uh, higher in the center than it is in the in the periphery. Out here, you can read these letters, but they have to be really big, okay? And and that tells you the difference between central vision and peripheral vision. And the central vision that we really care about is um, is called the macula, um, and the macula serves about the 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 central five, maybe up to ten degrees of vision. And just to give you a a, a benchmark. If you hold your thumb out at arm's length, that's about two degrees of vision, okay? So central vision is, is just a little stretch of, of space. Outside of central vision, your ability to detect, say, writing um, is, is, very, is very poor. Loss of vision in here is very devastating, and I just want to show you uh, what that what that looks, how that looks. Um, this is a, a picture that was drawn by my mother when she had an episode of, of macular degeneration. This is what vision would, this is how vision would look if the macula was not working. So here she is, she's looking at my father and her peripheral vision is fine. She can see all this stuff, but, uh, but the central vision is very poor. She has very little ability to, to see detail here. So that's, that's what um, the different, that's a big difference between central vision and, and peripheral vision. Um, okay, uh, finally, one of the things I wanna add here is uh, one of the things that we do to enable our vision is that we, we dart our eyes around to put different aspects of the visual scene at the center of our vision. So we make eye movements to enable us to understand a whole scene. Keeping your eyes steady is a very difficult thing to do. Uh, if, I'm, if I'm trying to do this and I wanna know what's out here, my first, my, my impulse is to, is to um, look out here, to change my point of fixation from here to here to look at it. Um, and so eye movements are very much coupled to visual acuity. People that have uh, developmental conditions that uh, prevent them from seeing at high acuity also have abnormal eye movements. All right, so now what we're gonna do is look at the, the development of the eye. And uh, in particular, we're gonna look at how we, uh, how we gain acuity through developing the eye to exactly the right length.